Breaking tonight, a new national uproar after police shoot a suspect near Baltimore and touch off a huge wave of controversial media coverage. Welcome to The Kelly File, everyone. I'm Megan Kelly. Many Americans awoke to the heartbreaking news today that a young black mother, Corinne Gaines, Gaines had been killed and her young son wounded after a nearly six-hour standoff with police on Monday. What was missing from some of those initial reports, however, was the fact that Gaines was allegedly pointing a shotgun at the responding officers as she sat on the couch with a five-year-old child. Police were attempting to serve arrest warrants to Gaines and a man named Kareem Courtney early Monday. No one answered at Gaines's apartment, but the officers could hear voices inside, including those of children. Here's how police described what happened next. They could clearly see a female that they believed to be Miss Gaines, seated on the floor, a child nearby, who immediately began to wield a shotgun around, bringing it up to ready position, pointing it directly at the officers there to serve the arrest warrants. The entire time throughout the afternoon, she repeatedly would point the weapon at our personnel. For hours, we pleaded with her to end this peacefully. We were concerned about the safety of the child. Gaines was even filming off and on as those hours unfolded, her young son's voice still in the background as she zoomed in on the rifle of an officer who was peering in the door at one point, and another gut-wrenching video taken during the standoff, Gaines asks her young son whether he is aware of the situation in which she has put him. What's happening right now? Who's outside? The police. And what are they trying to do? It's charging. What are they trying to do? They're trying to kill us. In moments, we're joined by Pastor Wesley West and radio host Kevin Jackson on the controversy over how this thing ended and where the story has gone since. But first, tonight, we begin with Trace Gallagher, who has the details that a lot of media outlets left out. Trace. Megan, prior to the five and a half hour standoff, Baltimore police were very aware of 23-year-old Corinne Gaines. Back in March, they pulled her over with her kids for not having a car license plate. Instead of the plate, there was a cardboard sign warning government officials not to stop her. And when police did, it quickly got confrontational. And Corinne Gaines videotaped it and posted parts of it on Instagram. Watch. You won't, I, I, I'll be, listen, honestly, I'm listen, all these chances. Why, I, a chance to do what? To get out of your car with your children. Sir, you're trying to steal my car. When you put your hands on me, I promise you, you will, you will okay, have to like murder to me. You right. will have to murder me. So go ahead and get ready to do that. Gaines was finally arrested and given a court date. When she failed to appear, Baltimore police went to her home to serve a bench warrant. Police say they could hear the man inside talking with her, but nobody came to the door, so they got a key from the manager, opened the door, and found Gaines sitting on the floor with a shotgun. Police backed away, and the barricade began. A short time later, the man inside ran out with a one-year-old baby and was arrested. Gaines stayed in the home with her five-year-old son. Police negotiators brought in her parents and a psychologist saying they made every effort to get the woman to surrender. All the while, Gaines was posting on social media, and her followers were encouraging her not to surrender. Police filed a request with Facebook and Instagram to disable her account, but it took more than an hour. And this is the final Instagram post. Watch again. What's happening right now? Who's outside? And what are they trying to do? It's charging. What are they trying to do? Police say when Gaines again pointed her shotgun at officers through the door, it prompted the exchange of gunfire. One shot by police, two shots from inside the apartment, three more shots by police. Corinne Gaines was killed, her five-year-old son hit in the arm. It remains unclear if the boy was hit by police gunfire or by his mother's. The boy is listed in good condition tonight. Wow. Megan. Trace, thank you. Joining me now, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Mark Eiglarsh and criminal rights and defense attorney Andell Brown. Wow. Mark, yeah. 
that all her all her anybody who dares point the finger at law enforcement is either being intellectually dishonest or somehow really doesn't know the facts in this case they were overly cautious they could have shot her right away when they came in and then held back six hours they waited and when they came in both with the words that she used, I will kill you, coupled with the action, not putting down this shotgun, they had to take action. She caused her death. Andel, do you agree? In a situation like this, a picture's worth a thousand words and a video is priceless. Here, we have the police account of the events, but we also had police accounts in the Walter Scott case, Laquan McDonald case, Tamir Rice case, where facts that were reported did not match up once we had a video. When we have citizens who feel the need, like in the Philando Castile or the Alton Sterling, to record interactions with police because the body cameras fell off, they aren't working, or whatever the case may be, it shows we have an issue with the trust and, and transparency and accountability. That's not what she asked. Look at her. This is her with the gun. This is her with a shotgun, Mark Iglars. This, I mean, that's on that's video. That's what we're told. That's not what we see. What? So what are you suggesting, yeah. Andel? Are you are you going to manufacture facts? What I'm suggesting facts? is in a Everything city like supports. Baltimore, I'm that looking was at it just right now. With the Freddie Gray, there should be using body cameras in this case. They there just got the body cameras a couple of weeks ago. They're implementing that in Baltimore. Well, Th great. We we need to see what happened. That's all I can say. I this can't make assumptions like how Mark much that it's all her it's without how seeing what happened because I've seen police reports that turned out not to be true once we saw the video. But Mark Eichler, okay. We're seeing we are seeing this is video from the moment this went down we can play and generic game I Wait, made it before. That. hold on hold on and we'll go with what you're saying you could throw out that generic comment all day long we never know because we weren't there we haven't seen reports and sometimes reports are wrong you're correct but here's the question based upon what they're reporting are you conceding that this was a justified shooting Mark, what I'm saying is I'm not just going to go with what the they answer is yes when or we no. Go into a, when if, we go into a court of law, saying. Mark, you don't control this interview. When we go into a court of law, we make sure we're very sure before we take someone's freedom. You just can't we make say sure the word, we go through you? many steps before we take someone's life. And when Della, an was a hypothetical. Hold on a second, guys. Hold on a second. The people deserve to see just and evaluate whether they're to correct Andel's or point. incorrect. Okay, to we have to keep the government honest. To your point, to Andel's point, the video of her loading up that gun was apparently from two weeks earlier. It wasn't this. This was two weeks earlier. It wasn't in the moment that she had the confrontation with the police who say she did have the long gun, who you can hear discussing with her son on the video um, that they're that they're she believes they're, they're trying to kill her. Um, and there's a question about her mental state, Mark. I mean, I don't know whether this woman was OK um, em emotionally or mentally, and the police would not confirm whether she had a history of mental health issues. But here she is um, just a couple of weeks earlier when she had the confrontation with police. She was pulled over. She didn't have a license plate. She considered herself a sovereign citizen. She didn't recognize the authority of the U.S. law enforcement agents. She demanded to see their authority cards. And this is a confrontation. This is a piece of tape from back then. Watch. You know they're talking about stealing my vehicle. Hey, Cody. They tell you get out this car or take your seatbelt off. You do not get out this car. Do you understand? Yes. You better fight they asses. Fight them. Do you hear me? Yes. And they will have to kill me today. No, nobody wants to They kill will you. have to. Fine. They will have to you in front of my children and everything. You. Why y'all burning hell? All y'all all right, so she's telling her child he has to get out. Her, I think it's her five-year-old. He has to get out and fight the police. That they're going to have to kill yeah. her to get her out of the car. The, 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 the officer asks for her license and registration. She refuses to show it. She demands to see his, his authority card. He shows it to her. So the question is whether this person was of sound yeah. mind and whether the police, if that is the case, had an obligation to do more, to not engage in a, in a shootout with this person. Okay, here's my take on her. I will defend her right to spew her outrageous and offensive speech, even y'all pigs, like she said at the end. She has a constitutional right to say that. But her constitutional rights end 
when she begins to resist and obstruct officers, as she did in that scenario, but worse, when she shows violence, when she has a gun aimed at law enforcement officers who didn't wake up wanting to kill anybody that day. They just wanted to go home to their families, and she created a scenario that led to her tragic demise. Go ahead, and I'll give you the last word. In this circumstance, it is absolutely a tragedy whenever someone loses life or, or liberty. In this country where life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness are high ideals, we take it very seriously. So I just want to make sure that in every one of these instances, we have the transparency and accountability to keep our government honest from the cops on the street all the way up to the White House. That's what the people deserve, and that's what we want. Great to see you both. Same here, Megan. Well, as we mentioned earlier, the response we're seeing to the story seems to be largely influenced by the fact that many of the headlines people have been reading make no mention of the fact that Ms. Gaines was allegedly armed and threatening to, to kill these police. Vox declared, quote, Baltimore County Police shot Corinne Gaines and a five-year-old was, was caught in the crossfire. Think progress, quote, police fatally shoot woman holding five-year-old boy in her lap. Sean King at the New York Daily News took things a step further, suggesting cynicism toward Corinne Games, Baltimore mom killed by cops, illustrates power of white privilege. And now, in a now-deleted tweet, the Washington Post's Wesley Lowry said, quote, every fatal police shooting, by definition, is a summary execution. Pastor Wesley West of Faith Empowered Ministries is a member of Black Lives Matter. And Kevin Jackson is a Fox News contributor and executive direct director of the BlackSphere.net. Great to see you both. Pastor, do you defend those headlines? Do you think those headlines are misleading in light of what we are, are told are the facts? Uh, well, I, I can't say it's misleading. I would say right now uh, there, is, there is a story behind it all. Uh, again, after what just happened here in Baltimore with the death of Freddie Gray and now this, uh, this shows uh, that no, n none of that is misleading at all. I stand behind everything that has been put out today on, the, on, on okay, in so her benefit. If you believe that, then wh what should the cops have, do, have done? If, if they went to this person's house, she skipped out on her court appearance, they, they have to execute a bench warrant, that's how it works. She mm -hmm. wouldn't let them in, they got the landlord to open the door. She's sitting there with a long gun and a five-year-old on her lap threatening them. Okay. What should they have done? Well, again, um, I think uh, that they have, they said they have backed down, which I don't believe they backed down at all. Here's a young lady again who, uh, who shows that there has been uh, some harassment by the police department. Um, at this point in time, they should have more. Uh, her family member come, come to, to come to the scene. Her family members actually come to the scene. Uh, they can, the and, cops and, and, called and, and them. The cops called them. They to come did help. That, that is from that. Wait a minute. We're talking about. Can I say this real quickly, Kelly? We're talking about the same police officer that have not issued a statement. Why are you giving part of the statement? I need the full statement. I need. The, I need the vote videos. Why haven't these oh, police geez. officers have body cameras on them? I need to see this. I, I need. I need to really see this. I don't. Don't tell me. Don't tell me what they say. I need to see this for myself. Okay. We're, where, where is, where is the record? It's rec true records? that the whole where, thing is, not, is, is not caught on a cop's body camera. They say they just got the mandate for these a couple of weeks ago in the whole week of Freddie Gray and everything else. Kevin, your thoughts? This is this is the more ridiculousness of the left, and it just goes to show why this this America can't improve, and particularly Black America. Look, this is cut and dry. The police did everything they could to not hurt this young lady. Uh, and by the way, the the fault goes with That's a young lady who would That's have true. two children who would have two children in her home and not surrender to the police and get everything worked out, no matter what. They're not saying anything about that. I'll tell you something else that won't be mentioned: the 35 people who were killed last month in Baltimore. Nobody's going to remember the name Javon Guy. He was shot and killed by other black people. This is patently ridiculous. America is sick of it. This young lady already yeah, had America, a history and, and of America not wanting to talk. I'll let you talk, I'll let you talk so just be quiet. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, the, this young lady had, had a problem already with police, and it was already documented. She wow. said, y'all are going to have to kill me in front of my kids. What more? Now, look, she, she probably had some sort of a mental problem. Who knows? But and, and nobody's saying she deserved to die per se. But everything that could have prevented her death, she could have done. Mm -hmm. And for this attorney and this pastor to sit here and act, to, to say these things is detrimental to the black community. You're teaching kids hate. You're teaching the black community the wrong lessons here. And go, he knows. Go ahead, it. Pastor. Listen, 
Listen, at some point in time, the police have to be held accountable for their actions. Again, <laughs> I, I do I do hear you. I do say, I hear you saying that they've done everything. Actually, they didn't. What happened to the tasers? What happened to the sleep gas? What happened to other measures? Here is a five-year-old, let, let's hear this, a five-year-old little boy she is in a home where shots are rang. Either way, whether she put the child on her lap, come on, it was just an incident in Baltimore where there was a hostage situation. This man did not die, and he had seven people that were held hostage. You know you, At a you, you, can, you can yell Come about on. you can yell about this why, all you why, want. Here's why? the real interesting part. Here's the interesting part, Pastor. Nothing has changed. It's the same. The five-year-old boy mayor did not Tim. deserve to it's see a, his mother shot, killed, killed. That's true, Pastor. Everyone can agree on that. That five-year-old boy should not have been in that serve. situation. The reason he was was because of his mother, who chose to put him. Whether she was in the right or wrong, she never should have had that child on her lap. Never. Never. I'm and giving the police word, Kevin, and I gotta go. Ma I, Megan, the other I can say what I can say what I want. I can say what I want. You can. I can say, I can say what I want. Go for no, it. No, but, I'm saying, I can, and you've been given so that for opportunity. Her to say, My only quickly, point is. No, I'm saying. The, no, I'm saying the, quickly. No, Kelly, quickly for no her. No responsible mother puts her five-year-old child could, on her lap while she's right, holding a long Kelly, gun her and say, engaging in a shootout with police. I agree, but uh, Kelly, for, this, for her to say that I'll kill you, for her to say I'll kill you, she can say what she wants. Understood. Then she can say, who said, but no, there who are ever saw the gun? We never saw the gun. We never saw the gun. I gotta go. I gotta go. Great to see you both. Breaking tonight, the Wall Street Journal just went up with a stunning story. It reports that the, that the Obama administration shipped $400 million in cash to the Iranians at the very same time that Iran was releasing those four American hostages. Remember that? The White House said at the time, we didn't, no, we didn't. We didn't pay money. And even now they say, no, we, there's no quid pro quo. That wasn't that money. No, no. But the critics are calling this a ransom payment, which would be directly contrary to U.S. policy. We're not allowed to pay ransom to get hostages back because that generally leads to more hostage taking. This story is just breaking. We're still gathering the details and we're going to have more for you very shortly. Plus, with the dust settling from these crazy primaries and the conventions now behind us, Glenn Beck is back for the first time in months to talk Trump, Clinton and the 2016 race ahead. And then we have brand new details in the killing that shocked the country. John Benet Ramsey's brother breaking his silence 20 years after his sister's unsolved murder. Stay tuned. Developing tonight, an eventful 24 hours for Donald Trump just keeps rolling with a series of events getting media attention today. Earlier today, the GOP nominee surprised supporters at a Virginia rally by requesting that a crying baby be removed from the crowd. Actually, I was only kidding. You can get the baby out of here. That's all right. Don't worry. I, I think she really believed me that I love having a baby crying while I'm speaking. <laughs> that that same event, a veteran handed over his prestigious Purple Heart to Mr. Trump, who joked that he's always wanted the award, but that it's much easier to come by as a gift. <laughs> You're asking Americans to trust you with their future. Then there was this moment, which you've heard about. Trump also spoke out about his ongoing feud with the Muslim family who took the stage at the DNC, talked about how their son gave his life for America while fighting in Iraq. Trump saying he has no regrets about questioning the cons and specifically wondering why the mother didn't speak. She later said she was too grief stricken. Also adding to a recent bout of campaign controversy, the answer Donald Trump gave when asked how he would want his daughter Ivanka to handle sexual harassment. Quote, I would like to think she would find another career or find another company if that was the case. Joining me now on all of this, Glenn Beck, founder of The Blaze and author of the Not brand new book. Time. Hold on, hold on, let me plug your book. <laughs> Liars, How Progressives yes. Exploit Our Fears for Power and Control. Hi, Glenn. Okay, so yeah. your thoughts How on those you? five items that Mr. Trump um, has generated I, today. I, quite honestly, um, I, I think, if I may, take it another direction. I think that the media and America is so myopic looking at the this cult of personality between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump that we're missing the real story. Um, and, and that is, and I urge people to look this guy up, it's the same kind of feeling and the same kind of research we did when we said there's a caliphate coming. Um, Russia is trying to destabilize our political system. Um, Dugan, who is a main advisor of Putin and a very dangerous man, thinks that Hitler just didn't go far enough. He's the guy who advised Putin to go into the Crimea. He is now giving speeches in Russia where he is saying we are 
um, infiltrated into the political system. <clears throat> he is he is thinking that Donald Trump is the answer. Not for I don't think he actually cares, and I don't think that either Hillary or Donald are involved in this in any way. But what they're trying to do is seed revolution on the streets. Those are their words, and this is what we should be talking about. This game is going to go on through November, and and I don't know how it ends, um, but I do believe, based on their words only, that Russia is trying to take down Hillary Clinton, try to. Um, uh, 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 destabilize our election and foment revolution on our streets. Mm -hmm. And I well, think you, you may you may be onto something there because General John Allen told me last week when he was endorsing Hillary Clinton that in, in his experience the Russians study our elections yes. very closely and they Russia, study our candidates very closely, almost Russia, from an anthropological standpoint to understand their Russia psyche. is trying. Russia is trying to do to us right now what we did to them under Ronald Reagan. Um, we have the same kind of things in play. We collapsed um, uh, the Soviet Union. Putin is going to pay us back, and that's exactly what he's trying to do right now. And the media and our politicians need to grow up and start talking about it. The one politician that should be on every channel tonight, and I'm not a fan of this man's policies, is Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney called this and everybody mocked him. Mm -hmm. We are about to find out that Russia is our biggest uh, our biggest foe and the biggest nightmare. Yeah, that was when President Obama said the, that Russia called and they want to get their, uh, yep. their 1980s, the 80s foreign policy called. back, I think, something yeah. like that. All right, let me yeah. ask you this, because there's other news to discuss tonight. <laughs> and specifically, I want to ask you about this. The latest polls show Hillary Clinton got a big bump out of her convention. Mm -hmm. uh, she's now beating Donald Trump in at least three polls. NBC has her with an eight-point lead. CBS has her with a seven-point lead. CNN has her with a nine-point lead over Trump. Now, back in May, you said, I'm telling you, Donald Trump is going to win this election. Given those polls, yeah. do you stand by that? I don't want to. I, I mean, I have no idea because I've been wrong every step of the way on this election. <laughs> I will tell you this as I watched both the, uh, you know, in my book, Liars, I talk about what are the tools that progressives use to convince us of these lies. It was quite amazing. One of the first tools is fear. The GOP ran high on fear, but so did the um, uh, so did the DNC. The DNC made it the fear of Donald Trump. But they did something that the Republicans didn't do. They told a very well-crafted story all the way through that we're better than this. That, uh, I mean, honestly, if I wasn't informed, if I was somebody who didn't know who Clinton was, I didn't recognize Marxist language, I would have watched that and thought, well, those are the people I want to be like, those people, I like those people, if I didn't listen to their policies mm -hmm. and I was uninformed. They're using hope the way that Barack yeah. Obama used to hope and change. I'll, the thing that is yeah, going to go play a, a real factor here is Russia. What happens to Russia? All right, I got to ask you this, because you were a big supporter of Ted Cruz's. When I found out he was speaking at the Democratic National Convention, I gave him a hard time on the show. He wasn't here, but I, you know, behind his back. I know. I mean, he could see I it almost, because people watch. I, I, um, I almost Facebooked you because I was I angry at you. Well, night. you know, I, I was saying, isn't it hypocritical of these politicians to get up there after they say, I hate this person, and then speak on their behalf? And you know, he and you sort of were saying, why don't you just hold on? Why don't you just, why don't you hold your horses, ma'am? And yeah. then he got up at the Republican National Convention and shocked the world with this. Please, don't stay home in November. If you love our country and love your children as much as I know that you do, stand and speak and vote your conscience, vote for candidates up and down the ticket who you trust to defend our freedom and to be faithful to the Constitution. So I was wrong in the uh, prediction of how that was going to go. And I want to ask you yeah. what you thought of the moment, because, of course, he was excoriated by so many as committing yeah, I, political I, I, suicide. Uh, I think if he, um, you know, if he had to do it all over again and he asked my opinion, which he didn't, um, I would say, you just don't just don't show up. Just just go away for a while. Um, however, I think that it gave a lot of people courage. You know, Bernie Sanders did the exact opposite, which is what all the people of the GOP said um, they wanted Ted Cruz to do. But soon as Bernie did that. Everybody on both sides of the aisle said, huge mistake for him. He sold out his values. His people no longer trust him. I think he's the only guy with any credibility who did the tough thing. When you saw that last 90 seconds of that speech, that was not easy Ted to Cruz. not cave. 
Ted yeah, Cruz. When Ted Cruz, when Ted Cruz stood there, he stood there and he spoke his principles and he spoke them with respect and decency. And he said, vote your conscience, vote for the guy who's going to follow the Constitution. It's ironic that everybody in the crowd was booing him as if somehow or another they know that Donald Trump's not going to follow the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was they, foolishly played on the RNC side. They wanted the full on, you know, vote for Donald Trump. Yep. Glenn, it's always a pleasure. Well, check out the book, Thank Liars. You. That's easy to remember. Liars, how progressives exploit our fears for power and control. Liars, Thank you, he says, liars. It's great to see you, Glenn. All the best. It's good to have like the pithy, the pithy title. More details coming in right now on our breaking news. The Wall Street Journal reporting tonight that the Obama administration shipped $400 million in cash to the Iranians. We're talking big, big piles of bills. They made sure it wasn't in U.S. currency. We'll get to why. At the very same time, Iran completely coincidentally was releasing four American, uh, Americans who had been held hostage. We have new reaction from the White House just breaking, and we've got the details on this story you'll be hearing a lot about tomorrow. Also tonight, a first in American presidential politics as President Obama tries to torpedo Donald Trump's White House hopes. Will it make a difference? Trump's spokesperson Katrina Pearson and Katie Pavlich are here next. Don't go away. Welcome back to the Kelly File, everybody. And what we believe is a first in American politics. While sitting presidents often campaign for their candidate, President Obama today went a big step further by calling on his political rivals to reject their own party's nominee for president. Watch. Yes, I think the Republican nominee is unfit uh, to serve as president. Uh, I said so last week, and uh, he keeps on proving it. And that's not my, just my opinion. That is the opinion of many prominent Republicans. There has to come a point at which you say, enough. The alternative is that the entire party, the Republican Party, effectively endorses and validates the positions that are being articulated by Mr. Trump. Joining me now, Katrina Pearson, national spokesperson for the Trump campaign, and Katie Pavlich, a Fox News contributor and news editor of townhall.com. Great to see you both. So, Kat, what did you make of the president specifically weighing in and calling Donald Trump unfit today? Well, what else is he going to say, Megan? There's still a little bit of the American dream left to kill, and he wants Hillary to do it. This is coming from the same guy who ran in 2008, probably one of the most qualified people to ever run for office, never have run anything or created a single job. And it's shown throughout his tenure. They have killed millions of jobs with Obamacare, now in an economy that's $2.2 trillion under average, and single-handedly dis disabled the Middle East, and with the help of Hillary Clinton, unleashed global terrorism. Okay. So, Katie, what we're seeing, though, is more and more Republicans kind of on the same track with President Obama. I mean, just today, we saw a New York representative come out and say, I'm not going to vote for him. I'm going to vote for Hillary Clinton, uh, Representative Richard Hanna. Uh, Governor Christie came out on the con comments, the con family comments, and said they were inappropriate. Paul Ryan said that we're in, the, we're in a fight right now for the soul of our party. What do you make mm -hmm. of it? Well, I don't think that we should uh, listen to President Obama as he lectures us about incivility and rhetoric, considering the past eight years and the things he said. But on that, that discussion, look, there's a lot of Republicans who have come out against what Donald Trump said about Captain Khan's family, and rightly so. And Mr. Trump needs to realize that this isn't simply about what he's saying, and that because he is not a typical politician, he can say whatever he wants and get away with, get away with it. But the fact is that other Republicans who are politicians running in tight races in the Senate and the House can't afford to be tied to those comments. And on that point, Donald Trump has his base locked up. He has the people who are going to vote for him, voting for him. They're not going to change their mind no matter what. They've said it in polling across the board. What does it do for Donald Trump to be attacking the family of an American war mm -hmm. hero at this point? And why Can can't you he just that, apologize Katrina? I mean, for that? I know he says he's a counterpuncher, but well, he, has to be a smart, he has to be a smart politician to win the presidency. And is it smart to go after the Khan family in the way he did. Well, first, let's clarify, Donald Trump didn't attack anyone. He simply responded to the attacks against him. Uh, and secondly, this congressman you spoke of has like a 31% rating on the Heritage Action Scorecard. So he's essentially been voting with Democrats the whole time. And let's not pretend that these recent comments is what's really fueling the fire for some of these Republicans. I mean, these are the same Republicans who haven't been following the party platform for decades, which is exactly why Mr. Trump was so successful. And if they want to continue to insult 
13 and a half million Republican voters, they should go right ahead because they won't forget that. But, you know, Megan. she didn't really answer the question, Katie, right. about whether it was smart of Donald Trump, even if it was a, quote, counter attack against a gold star family. Is that smart? And has that well, helped Donald Trump? <laughs> It's not smart. And uh, Donald Trump, in my opinion, did attack the Khan family by saying that he, Mr. Khan, had no right to criticize him when his son died, in fact, for his right to say whatever he wanted on a national stage, despite whether it's political. And you know what, Megan? Dana Prino tells this great story in her book about how President Bush, when he was at Walter Reed, he was visiting families, and there was a mother there who was going to be a gold star mother as her, her son was sitting in a hospital bed, and she was angry and she said some words to President Bush and he left that hospital saying in the helicopter on the way out with tears on his face that mama sure was mad at me and I don't blame her and that's how presidents lead and that's what the attitude should be moving forward and it's unfortunate that, that okay. Donald Trump can't take that position and just yeah, in case the, you're wondering the difference the here though Dana's Katie is that is Donald Trump had nothing is. to do with the war he didn't send anybody into war in fact he's been against the war no, Hillary none of us Clinton had anything to do with the war but, but, but the it situation. doesn't make a difference we don't we don't attack the family he's being attacked right. Donald Trump no but he didn't attack indecent. the family that's my yes, point he was talking about being attacked why did he ask whether the mother was allowed to speak Katrina because if you're looking at the segment, they talk about the reports that he has seen. And this father apparently so has what? been a strong and there are a lot of reports, Sharia law and been writing about everything. It doesn't it. mean the presidential so candidate So it's really has to not that them. far fetched. All right, I got to go because I have another panel waiting for well, I mean, to no, wait on you're that. absolutely right, but. I'm sorry. They, they did that, and it's kind of rude, but we do have another panel sitting here. Well, this fight between Donald Trump and the Khan family has been spinning out over the last four days. A huge number of people have been piling on the candidate. But now there's a new letter that's gone viral from a combat vet questioning Mr. Khan's remarks and his defense of Democrats. He writes in part, quote, does it matter whether Mr. Trump has sacrificed nothing and no one? That's a quote from Mr. Khan. Has Mrs. Clinton sacrificed for this nation? How about Mr. Obama? He goes on, as a father, I cannot imagine the pain you must feel. This is to Mr. Khan. But his sacrifice, meaning Khan's son, is his own. He was not forced to serve. The man behind that letter joins us now, Chris Mark served as a U.S. Marine and Navy officer. He was also a scout and a sniper who deployed overseas. And Howie Kurtz is here, too. He's been following the media aspect of this. Great to see you both, Chris. So, what? Thank you, it's an interesting point because Mr. Khan wanted to know if Donald Trump had sacrificed. And Trump came out and said, you know, I've sacrificed plenty. I've worked hard. And man, did he get, did he get hit for, for answering the question that was posed. Go ahead. Yeah, so I, I thought it was a bit um, exploitive of him to say that, and, and simply being there, and you know, and forgive me for saying this, but kind of bringing his his son, who, by all accounts, is a true American hero. I mean, nobody is ever you know disputing that, into this you know political debate. Um, you know, there are only two criteria to be president in the United States: to be a U.S. citizen and 35 years old. So I, I have a little bit of uh, I take exception with the fact when people say, you know, what have you sacrificed? The fact uh, whether or not you have or have not sacrificed in defense of this nation doesn't imbue you with any additional privileges and that's that's really what compelled this this blog post mm -hmm. and you talk uh, in your in your open letter about uh, you feel that he was paraded that mr. And mrs. Khan were paraded on the stage by Democrats what do you mean by that because you know I think they would respond by saying we, we wanted to be there we object to Donald Trump and his presidency sure. and we wanted our voices heard <laughs> Yeah, and you know, let me be honest, uh, Megan. After watching the cons again and rereading his comments, without the context of them being at the DNC and without all the fanfare and the emotion and everything, you know, I, I would like to kind of revise that statement. Um, I think that they did that; they had an objective, but I, I don't think they were necessarily paraded any longer. And again, I had to, you know, review my comments without the context of them being in the DNC. Again, I think it was either exploitive on the part of the DNC to put them out there, and. and and again, if you look at Mrs. Smith from the RNC, she was taken to task for going out and talking about her son dying in Benghazi. And it seems like the cons are being treated a bit differently. So it's either exploitive okay, so that's, on that's the DNC's where I part, pick it up with Howie. or I think it's a little bit opportunistic. Do you think there's been a difference, Howie? Do this, do, do the, does the coverage prove that there's been a difference between the media's reaction to Pat Smith, mother of, ben, of a Benghazi victim, and to the cons? Absolutely, it is not even close. And by the way, they both committed political acts by speaking at political conventions, and they both spoke from the heart, and I respect their right to speak out on behalf of their fallen sons. But if you look at the media coverage, and yes, Donald Trump fueled it in the case of uh, Kaiser Khan by criticizing the family, but even before he said a word, 
Uh, the media rocket fuel embracing the con message almost as if th as their own uh, front page of the New York Times putting them on meet the press on the Today Show all over cable showed that uh, the, that Khan's message and his uh, accusation against Trump as an anti-Muslim bigot had a resonance from most of the mainstream media that Patricia Smith's very heartfelt comments in Cleveland did not and what do you think the reason for that is I think, you know, when you strip it all away, and yes, you know, Patricia Smith had made this point in interviews many times, so she wasn't breaking news, and there are mitigating factors. But when you really come down to it, I think the consensus in the mainstream media is that Patricia Smith was being unfair in personally blaming Hillary Clinton for the death of her son, and that Kaiser Khan, uh, while not blaming, obviously, uh, uh, Trump for what happened during the Iraq War, was speaking for many Americans who don't like Trump's uh, proposed temporary ban on Muslim immigrants. And so it just had more personal. I mean, she she is alleging that she was lied to directly about her son's death by Hillary Clinton. You know, the Khan family's just objecting to Donald Trump's policies and his statements. They're not alleging a, a dishonest personal interaction with the casket of their son steps away, which is, that's why we put Pat Smith on the air, and you can think whatever you want about Pat Smith or Mr. and Mrs. Khan, but they were given a platform. Uh, they were given a platform. We invited the Khan family on here. So far, no luck, but they've been all over media, and hopefully they'll come here eventually. It's great to see you both. Thanks, Megan. Thank you. Up next, Mark Thiessen is here on the breaking news reports out of Iran that the Obama administration ship shipped $400 million in cash to Iran at the very same time that country was releasing four Americans who had been held hostage. Plus, 20 years after the murder of John Benet Ramsey, her brother, her brother is finally breaking his silence. We'll have a full report. Breaking tonight, the White House just responded to a stunning new report out of the Wall Street Journal saying the Obama administration secretly airlifted $400 million in cash to Tehran. At the very same time, four American hostages were released. Critics are calling it a ransom payment, and we are not supposed to pay ransoms. The White House is denying that, saying this cash had nothing to do with the hostages, but was part of a payment the U.S. agreed to, going all the way back to the time the Shah was still in power. Mark Thiessen is a Fox News contributor and a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Mark, so, I mean, you was it a quid pro quo? Uh, of course it was a quid pro quo. Their denials are completely laughable. I mean, first of all, uh, the Wall Street Journal reports that U.S. officials admitted to the journal that Iranian negotiators on the hostage deal were actually asking for this money in exchange as, as a sign that they were making progress. So this, this was a, a literally a specific request the Iranian hostage negotiators were making. And second of all, if it wasn't a ransom deal, why the secrecy? Why, why send an unmarked plane with pa wooden pallets filled with Swiss francs and other non-U.S. US currency in the dead of night to arrive in Tehran just by the way by coincidence on the very day uh, that the hostages are released and why keep it secret from Congress and the American people I mean why were they perhaps worried that the United American people would be upset to learn that they were evading US sanctions law because it is illegal under US sanctions law to give cash to the Iranian regime and they were giving them hard hard currency that they can use to fund terrorism support the Assad regime in Syria and advance their nuclear program I think America would be pretty upset to learn about it as they probably are tonight so w why is it a bad idea to pay ransoms and uh, why do you think we did it if that's what we did um, well, the, the reason it's a bad idea to pay ransoms is because it incentivizes the kidnapping of Americans. So if President Obama sat down in the Oval Office and said to himself, hmm, how can I come up with a policy that will incentivize Iran and other countries to kidnap American citizens around the world, this would be the policy. And guess what? It's worked. Since he made that cash payment, Iran has taken more Americans hostage and demanded more money. They, in, since the payments were made, they've taken two more American, Iranian Americans yeah. hostage. They've taken uh, uh, dual nationals from France. France, from Canada and the UK. Coming up and on second, a hard break, Mark. i got to leave it at that. But there's right. a lot more on this story, and we'll continue it. And by the way, again, the White House is denying this. They're saying there is no connection. Up next, the very latest on John Benet, Ramsey's brother, speaking out. Developing tonight for the first time, the brother of murdered beauty pageant princess, little John Benet Ramsey, now breaking his silence. Burke was nine years old when his sister was brutally murdered, and their parents quickly became the prime suspects for a time. Trace Gallagher live in L.A. with the latest. Trace? 
Megan, all the investigative records and statements indicate that when six-year-old JonBenet Ramsey suffered a skull fracture and was strangled somewhere inside the Ramsey home, her nine-year-old brother Burke was soundly sleeping inside his room. In fact, in 2008, two years after Patsy Ramsey died of ovarian cancer, all three members of the Ramsey family were cleared of any wrongdoing. And yet in 2010, 14 years after the murder, Boulder police wanted to speak with Burke Ramsey. At the time, the family attorney called it harassment and Burke Ramsey he refused the offer. It's unclear exactly what investigators were trying to unlock in Burke's memory, but now Dr. Phil tells the Kelly file that his interview will have, quote, shocking never before heard details about the case. And there are many unanswered details, like no forced entry, no footprints in the snow, a ransom note written on a piece of paper inside the home, just to name a few. Somebody certainly killed John Benet Ramsey. And we will soon get information we have likely never heard. Wow. Megan? Fascinating. I'll be watching that one. Trace, thank you. We'll be right back. Don't go away. So we're closing in on two million Twitter followers at Megan Kelly. Would love why don't you help us go over the top <laughs> and we will just happen to deliver four hundred million dollars in cash and it will have nothing, <laughs> it won't be related at all.